of mind. For the, those who are intoxicated by the sense of meaningfulness of life, there's no compromise. There is only an utter shattering, without bargaining, that is, whatever happens after that, we don't know. We just uh, can't stand the untruthfulness of the self. That's what it is. Because the only truth there is, 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 is the one and only self. It's like one sees oneself as an untruth, like a, like a lie, like a, a, a treason of truth. It's not like just being a little bit dissatisfied with certain aspects of oneself. It's like the whole thing seems to be based upon such a hoax. And how can I continue letting myself be caught in this hoax? How can I say, La ilaha illallah, there's only one being, and I still, I'm the one who says it. <clears throat> Doesn't make sense. <clears throat> <clears throat> He, Al Halad says, every eye circulates, <clears throat> no, the divine eye circulates in all those false eyes. <clears throat> you see that this is a very, very complete, uh, a very thorough, uh, uncompromising, ex uh, it's more than an experience, it is, as I say, a complete transformation of one's being. Nifari, Nifari. He was uh, one of those dervishes who you never saw. He was, he used to go in the desert for weeks and weeks and weeks, and then would come home to his family <clears throat> for a few hours, perhaps, and say the most incredible things. And his daughter would write it down on parchment and uh, leaves and things like that. And again, and what he said didn't seem to make sense. And and uh, they r rank now amongst the greatest things that any human being has ever uttered. <clears throat> For example, he was the one who said, <clears throat> you think that God created you in order to experience through you? <laughs> he created you I no, rather he condescended to descend out of the solitude of his unity out of love for you. The mystery of love. You see, it is love that is um, conducted so far that um, the self is completely uh, annihilated in the one one loves. So that uh, many of the Sufis say, <clears throat> the beloved is all, the lover is nothing. He is a cover, he is a dead uh, being. <clears throat> you know what it means to love, even humanly, to love to such an extent that one the beloved means everything. One is, one just isn't important. That's the way to be shattered in the sense of yourself, by love. Understanding, yes, <clears throat> for the one to whom understanding is important, it's a very traumatic experience when his understanding is shattered. <clears throat> it's part of the shattering of the being. But the shattering of love is still greater. When, I don't know, you, one goes through such <coughs> agony of heart. Because it is the ego that is uh, the most involved in love. That's, that's the thing that is, that is attacked by love. So that you become egoless. Imagine that you were walking about without a self, and you just didn't know where yourself was. Yourself is in orbit somewhere. 
who can't find it anymore. <clears throat> and can just, uh, the, just the thought of the beloved is so, so overwhelming that there's nothing else that, imp that, uh, that is important except the, the, the beauty or the wonder or the glory of the beloved. Think what it does to you. Well, according to the Sufis, according to Nifari, this is the way in which God becomes you. Because when you think that you are loving, you're in love, it is his love that is creating you and that you experience as though it were annihilating you. And in fact, it is creating you by annihilating you. And you can't be created without being annihilated. Hazrat Inat Khan once, says, once said, Christ cannot be without a cross. A life cannot be without death. Love cannot be without fana, which means annihilation. And don't think that Sufism then is the science of annihilation. No. <clears throat> It is the way of resurrection, but resurrection passes through annihilation. <clears throat> and then we think that, well, this now this is the stage, then this is the final stage, and that is the self. <clears throat> That's the whole problem is to finally overcome the illusion of the self and let the one and only self act. <clears throat> Maybe there's another stage beyond the self that sees and experiences. And that's the presence. We use this word so much. I want to be in this person's presence. The person who loves wants to be in the presence of the loved one or the beloved. What does it mean to be in the presence? <clears throat> You're still in duality. You want to be in the presence of a rishi. You want to be in the presence of a dervish. You want to be in the presence of the person you love. Duality. You're still in duality. <clears throat> but imagine the time when you can say like al-halaj, There is only thee, thou. Thou art present in the tears between my eyebrow, my eyelids <clears throat> and in the blood in the walls of my heart. There is nothing but thee everywhere. <clears throat> the sense of the presence. So first of all, there's a longing, <clears throat> the nostalgia, ishk, for, for God, for the model, for the eternal being, for the presence. And then finally, the realization of being the presence. Now the key to this is that you look upon your human, how does your human self look to you when you have lost the sense of yourself? It's a completely reversed way of of, of, of looking, isn't it? <clears throat> uh, so, it appears as another yourself. It's the only word, the only way to... You, of course, our grammar is completely wrong. Of course, it just won't, won't express what we're trying to express. <clears throat> so we have to use paradoxical terms. Another yourself... It's like seeing part of yourself in another. Like, I suppose, well, one certainly experiences it in one's children. It's like another yourself. One way of doing it. One way of experiencing it. Of experiencing it. Of course, Al-Halad speaks about that original state in which uh, God was 
experiencing himself in other himselves, first of all in another himself and then in many other himselves, in which he his being manifested in some way, the different as aspects of his being manifested in some way. So imagine that you go about in the world and wherever you look, you see another yourself uh, manifesting some aspect of yourself. This is an experience which is mentioned in the Isha Upanishad, as a matter of fact. This is the way of the Sufis. You see, it's a such so completely a different way of seeing and experiencing. Just it just doesn't seem to have any common uh, bearing with um, the ordinary way of experiencing. Well, what does it do to you? If we could only enter into the being of those great Sufis. and realize what they are. I'm not saying what they were, because actually there's no such thing as death. Well, the one thing that strikes one first is the ecstasy. The ecstasy of their beings. It is the greatest power there is in the world. Ecstasy. If you have ecstasy and you communicate ecstasy to another being and then that being communicates it to another being. It's the greatest force there is. <clears throat> what are people looking for? Everywhere. To be high. That's the... Uh, finally, uh, America <clears throat> has reached the concept of being high. Hmm? It's been there all the time, uh, but we found a word now. <laughs> to say what people have been looking for all this time. <clears throat> to be high. <clears throat> that means to be carried beyond the prison of the self because it's unbearable. It's finally to, to, to merge into that mystery that one feels is always above one's head, like a, it's always a present, it's always tangent, <clears throat> within a few meters, within a few inches, and yet it seems, of course, it isn't possible to hold it. It is elusive. It's the mystery of God. We want to uh, ascend the steps of the castle. We want to take the, the walls of the castle by storm, <clears throat> like Abu Yazid Bastami, Abu Yazid Bastam, you will come across him this afternoon, <clears throat> unless you have already. <clears throat> well, he is one of those uh, very austere ascetics uh, of the um, northern mountains of Iran. <clears throat> he was a very strong being. He could not stand anything but the truth. <clears throat> he couldn't stand the veil on the face of God. This is the veil. Everything that appears is the veil. It's the manifestation, right? And on the other hand, it's the veil. Glory to the one, said Faridu Dinatar, who veils God, <clears throat> who veils himself by manifesting himself, and who manifests himself by veiling himself. Abu Yazid Bastami could not stand just the appearance, he wanted the experience of God. <clears throat> and because of that, he was prepared to go into the loneliness, into the solitude, uh, not just, you know, the solitude of the mountains, <clears throat> but the solitude of the soul. I think many of you feel that need. To get away from all this sham, into that great wilderness within where everything is a little bit like the hard rocks, you know, beyond in the high mountains you'll experience that in Chamonix, those who come. Beyond the greenery there's a place that there's only just hard rocks <coughs> and water. <coughs> uh, everything is desolate, but there's such purity there because it's away from the profusion of life. <coughs> 
uh, he speaks about the denial of the denial and the none the the lack of the lack and the want of the want and the well depravity of depravity that's the via negativa that the latin church fathers used to talk about <clears throat> the way that is uh, the way into the abnegation of all that is life the way of the ascetic and he was hoping to find uh, the total experience of union with god by this uh, very solitary path <clears throat> <clears throat> And yet it was his will that was standing in the way of his experience. <clears throat> and so we are faced with a great dilemma because we feel that we must do something about it. And on the other hand, we realize that we have to let the operation of God take place within us. We mustn't hinder the operation, but we cannot do it by our will. <clears throat> and this is what a lot of you will come across in meditation. When you come to a point when you think, I've often said, as a matter of fact, shake yourself, awaken. Well, that's an act of will, isn't it? <clears throat> and that's, you have to start by doing something yourself. But there comes a time when you have to let the divine action take place through you. And that is where you have to become like a blind man led by one who loves you. <clears throat> you have to be able to trust that when the fragments of your heart have been shattered into pieces and you can't find yourself again, some being of compassion will draw the pieces of your heart together again that when you have succumbed <clears throat> into nothingness, a compassionate being will revive you into life again. When you have gone beyond life, a compassionate being will bring you back into life again. When you have experienced the purity beyond existence, you will be able to bring that purity back and show forth something of the divine purity in your being. Well, this is the way of the Sufi. <clears throat> I'm sorry, we do not give you any crutches. <clears throat> we don't give you any theories. We don't give you any systems. We don't even give you, uh, we don't give you any dogmas. We don't even give you a belief. What's the use of a belief if it isn't something that you know? We don't ask you to say, I believe in this or I believe in that, until you actually know. And when you know, you don't have to believe, you know. <clears throat> and you only know when you're not there to know it anymore. <clears throat> you only know it when you experienced God experiencing self through every being. <coughs> and this is what Hazrat Inat Khan calls the divine perfection working within human limitation. And so great is that sense of divine perfection that the limitation in which you are functioning will take nothing away from the divine perfection in you. And that's where you can give life and joy and peace to all people around you. Amazing.